model training stations and stuff. They make what? Model training stations and stuff. Yeah. They actually the main audience now, the main consumers of dry transfer lettering. Because now nowadays you can like print stuff off of paper, right? But they still need the dry transfer letters to like put all the names and their words and their like model trains. Hmm. So I went on like a train hobbyist. Oh my god. Like, yeah. <laughs> like a train diorama hobbyist. I'm so like all of transfer. Oh. My transfer sheets. Oh, that's amazing. So I'm going to try using it. Looks good. <laughs> and I realized your shirt had stripes on it, which are kind of like this jacket. Oh, no, we're not changing. <laughs> we honestly are coordinating. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to the Studio School. I'm Kara Carmack, the Exhibitions and Public Programs Officer here at the school, and I'm honored to welcome you to the first event of our Spring 2023 Evening Lecture Series. We're thrilled to have artist Oscar Yi Ho in conversation with curator Eugenie Tsai. Before we begin, I would like to note that the New York Studio School Evening Lecture Series is free to the public with support in part by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Additional funding is generously provided by the Robert Lehman Foundation, the Samuel H. Cross Foundation, and individual donors. Please consider making a donation to help keep our evening lecture series free by clicking on the support button on our homepage. Thanks to those of you joining us virtually and here on 8th Street. We'll reserve time at the end for a Q&A with the audience. For those in the room, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you so our online audience can hear your question. For our Zoom audience, please submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Following the lecture, please join me and our guests in the adjacent student gallery right outside these doors for light refreshments. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speakers this evening. Oscar Yi Ho is an artist and writer based in New York. He was born and raised in Liverpool, England. He received his BA in visual art from Columbia University. He has also studied at the L'Ecole des Arts de la Sorbonne. His work is anchored in personhood, pulling together a syncretic field of iconography that describes complex layers of identity and relation. Alongside his solo exhibition, East of Sun, West of Moon at the Brooklyn Museum, which is currently on view through September 17th, 2023. Yiho is recipient of the third annual Wovo Prize in 2022. In 2021, he presented a sky liquor relation and a dozen poem pictures at James Fuentes, New York, and James Fuentes Online, respectively. His work has also been included in exhibitions at the Royal Academy in the UK, the Asia Society in New York, T293 Gallery in Rome, Italy, the Cone Gallery in Los Angeles, and Sprout Moggers Online. Eugenie Tsai is the John and Barbara Vogelstein Curator of Contemporary Art at the Brooklyn Museum, where she recently organized Oscar's show, currently on view. Previously, she was Director of Curatorial Affairs at PS1 Contemporary Art Center in Queens, New York. She's presented a number of exhibitions highlighting the Brooklyn Museum's contemporary collection. In addition, she's organized exhibitions including Sanford Biggers, Sweet Funk and Introspective, Li Ming Wei, The Moving Garden, Latoya Ruby Frazier, A Haunted Capital, Valerie Hegarty, Alternative Histories, Crossing Brooklyn, Art from Bushwick, Bed-Stuy and Beyond, organized with Rue Hockley, and Kahinde Wiley, A New Republic. Other exhibitions of note include the Mid-Career Survey, Threshold, Byron Kim, 1990-2004, to at the University of California, and Robert Smithson at the Whitney Museum of American Art, which received the International Association of Art Critics First Place Award for the Best Monographic Exhibition of 2005. Dr. Sai received a BA from Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, and a PhD from Columbia University. 
Now please join me in offering a very warm welcome to Oscar and Eugenie. Thank you, Kara, um, for that lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, in conversation with Oscar about his exhibition, well, about his exhibition, East of Sun, West of Moon, and, and Other Things. Hello, things. Yes. Other Things. <laughs> uh, and I love his title, Concepts of Practice. Um, as Kara mentioned, Oscar is a third recipient of the WOVO Prize, which is a collaboration between the Brooklyn Museum and WOVO Arts Services and Storage, which has facilities na nationwide. The purpose of the prize is to recognize the t um, talent, emerging talent of a Brooklyn-based artist. And of course, that term emerging is open to interpretation. It has often nothing to do with age. In this case, I suppose it does. <laughs> um, and the prize includes an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. It includes uh, also a mural on the facade of the WOVO facility in Bushwick, which we'll see in a, a little while. So Oscar's exhibition represents two years of work. It, is a, it features 11 paintings, seven of which he made especially for the exhibition. Um, when you come, I know I'm happy to hear a number of you have seen the show. Uh, clearly, the show represents, um, it, it is a show of figurative painting and portraiture, and it very much represents a renewed interest in the figure and portraiture, especially on the part of artists of color and queer artists. The exhibition um, is also um, shown at a time of increased violence against East Asians. So um, it is, in some senses, about making communities visible, East Asians and also queer communities. So uh, a little bit about context. OK, Oscar is showing us slides of the exhibition itself. It's always hard to convey a sense of an exhibition in, in slides. Um, so you're already in the show. The room has been divided into two, and I noticed you didn't have a, um, the opening wall. I was going to say something to you. I didn't have the JPEGs for Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> um, so the first room is devoted to what I would call your friends, and the second room is devoted to a series called Cooleisms, and are often featuring you, and perhaps you'll talk about that. Yeah, so the exhibition could roughly be split into two bodies of work. The first body, which you see in these slides, are essentially um, explorations of relation, um, the relationships that I share with other people, uh, my community, uh, things like that. Um, and I'll go a little more into it um, later, but you'll, you'll see throughout the paintings that I um, do this aesthetically and formally by encoding my relationship um, via symbols frequently. Um, but the second body of work, do I have the pictures? The top right, I think the top right. Yeah, we'll, we'll see more pictures of it as the slides go on. But the second body of work is my body of work called Coolisms. Um, and it essentially explores um, what I call yellow iconicity, or um, it examines the ways in which, I guess, um, visual manifestations of East Asian people have appeared throughout Western visual culture, generally dated from the late 19th century until today. This is the mural in Bushwick. Right, so the mural's based on the painting that we don't have a JPEG of. Birds of a Feather, a.k.a. The New Family. Is that the whole title? A New Family Portrait. A New Family Portrait. Yeah. And uh, if you go back, I want to mention two things about it. First of all, it features you and two of your friends. Um, basically, it's, it, it, the mural blow, blew up the painting, but you added some letters over mm -hmm. the mural, mm -hmm. um, which is the title of the work backwards, mm -hmm. right? So I'm really fascinated first by your choice of title, mm 
mm -hmm. the way you use titles. And secondly, by the way, you often use backwards writing. Yeah. Because, of course, it looks backwards to us, but to the subjects in the painting who are, might be looking at it, they can read it. And one of the things your work addresses, um, which is suggested by your very poetic title, East of Sun, West of Moon, is a kind of in-betweenness, a kind of moving between celestial bodies um, and that notion of hybridity. Mm -hmm. And I think, I'm, I'm just really curious about your use of kind of backwards writing as another device, a formal device, to kind of suggest different positionalities, meaning you can be in front of the painting, you can be in the painting, there is no fixed point of view. Mm -hmm. So I'm ju just wondering if that was conscious, if that's something that happened. It's definitely conscious. Uh, later on in the presentation, there'll be a few slides explaining my uh, examination of language. Um, but part of what interests me so much about kind of essentially opaque lettering, um, English lettering, which is difficult to read, which is inverted, uh, which is buried. Um, I was kind of, it's a sensation of um, being estranged from, from language. You know, the letters look similar, they're Roman letters, but they're uh, horizontally inverted, um, which is similar to my relationship to the Chinese language. Um, since I can't read or write, I can kind of speak, not really. Um, but it has a certain, it's, it's very familiar to me, aesthetically, but semantically, it has no meaning to me, really. Um, so by treating English in the same way, by trying to give um, English-speaking people a similar experience of estrangement from language, it's kind of indexing that sensation of dislocation and estrangement. Um, it's also related to my kind of um, thinkings on opacity, uh, which I'll get into later as well. Do you want to show the next image, or should we? Oh, maybe I should say a word about how how you came to get the prize and what the process was yeah. in terms of. Okay, so yeah. um, oh, these are all of the eleven works in the exhibition. Four of them borrowed, and seven of them painted very methodically by Oscar over the course of six it's months. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and it, it was the most impressive thing. One of the most impressive, most disciplined. Um, executions I've ever seen. Um, okay. Very impressive. Okay, so um, the, the WOVO Prize, there, um, it's, uh, there's a co committee of the museum that nominates artists who are based in Brooklyn. Um, and then the, those candidates are discussed and um, one person is, is chosen. I saw Oscar's work at James Fuente's gallery, the exhibition that Cara mentioned, the Sky Licker, um, exhibition, and I really responded to it. Um, of course, his work reminded me of Martin Wong, but it isn't that I thought he was copying Martin Wong. I, I felt that he was channeling Martin Wong in some ways and, and painting communities, um, certain communities in New York City. And there was, of course, the interest in, in the cowboy, but in Oscar's case, this kind of Chinese cowboy imagery um, that I responded to. And of course, I'm very, I mean, Oscar, like Oscar, I'm, well, um, the child of immigrants. I don't speak any dialects, nor do I read. And so, you know, look, Chinese is pretty foreign to me. Yeah, um, yeah so I think um, people responded to your, the kind of um, vibrancy of the painting the kind of sensuality of the painting and the directness um, with which you depict the sitters, but also the clear conceptual underpinnings of your work. So it was kind of sensual and conceptual simultaneously, which mm -hmm. is not, what, um, which is sometimes unusual. Yeah, so I was nominated actually. I, I was one with three nominees, right? And then I, I wrote a proposal uh, like a 30 page, I spent yeah. a month I thought writing. it was 70 pages, but maybe that was with the pictures. <laughs> yeah, it was very, 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 very long. Um, I was also writing essays that would later become part of my book that I published with James Prentice Press. Um, so I was very much in kind of a writing slash conceptual um, mood for those two months. 
Um, but as a result, I was kind of thinking really curatorially uh, for the show, um, especially because it was, I knew it was taking place in a museum. I wanted it to be, to have that more kind of, um, I feel like when you get wall text in a show, it's a great opportunity to um, you know, express some concepts or express some histories and things like that. Um, so as we'll see in the slides, I endeavored to make the exhibition um, site-specific by using objects within the Brooklyn Museum's Asian Art Archive. So this is the, okay, you want to, so this is a work that you were working on when I first came to your studio in April. Yep. Uh, and you had this on the easel and I was kind of wondering where where it was going, yeah, what the, it was about. This was the first piece that I did for the show and as I was writing the proposal, uh, after I found out I was nominated, I was already working on this piece. Um, so it is emblematic of a few aspects of my practice. Uh, the, first, the, f the first one is uh, encoding information through symbols and signifiers. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm kind of interested in the relationships that I share with people. Uh, whenever I do a painting of someone else, I always consider actually a painting of the relationship that I share with another person or other people. I'm not presenting some kind of objective view. I'm not, I'm not speaking for them, nor am I letting them speak. Ideally, I'm trying to speak with them or simply attest to my relationship with them. Can we back up and say who these people are and how you, how you yeah. came to paint them? Uh, the person in the front is my really good friend, Amanda. She's an artist. And the person in the back is her partner. Um, so let's see, income information. Yeah, so let's go on. The image on the left is where I began compositionally. Um, it's a promotional image for the movie Sayonara, uh, released in 1957, featuring Marlon Brando and Miko Taka. Uh, the movie is, it's, it's like an anti-racist movie, um, sensibly, uh, but it still kind of deals with those tropes of, um, you know, white man going to Asia and saving these oriental women. So I was interested in that kind of context and I wanted to um, remix that and kind of upend it by having um, this queer Asian couple um, embody the poses done by Marlon Brando and Miko Taka. Um, additionally, let me go back a bit. So you guys see the, the circle thing, right? That I drew from a plaque, um, ornamental plaque as part of the Book of Museum's Asian art collection. Um, I wanted to essentially um, create a painting and a work of art, and you'll see it throughout the pieces that draws upon all these different histories from very different time periods to make it purposefully anachronistic. Um, yeah. Well, one of the things I like about your work, or I admire about your work, is the way that the title alone can be so suggestive of the history of East Asians in America. So when I read this, Sayonara Susie Wong, AKA Out of the Opium Den, I Googled, had to Google everything. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm very interested in your, all of your titles are an AKA, also known as. And again, I thought about it and, and thought that perhaps it's another way of suggesting positionality and, that, and, and different points of view, that each title is not a single thing, but it has at least two options. So the Sayonara movie I thought was very interesting because it's a history of America in, it was set during the Korean War. And, um, and the Susie Wong is about, set in the 60s, and it's about a white male artist who goes to Hong Kong, a British colony at the time, to see if he can be an artist. Mm -hmm. And he gets off the boat and he sees this beautiful Asian woman who he thinks, well-dressed, he thinks she must be a wealthy person and then goes to his, uh, his, this dive bar and you know, gets the key to his studio and discover that she's a sex worker who hangs out at the bar mm -hmm. uh, and they start going out. So it's very much what you're saying, a kind of white savior, but mm -hmm. it's also very much about the history of the United States in the Asian 
um, Asia Pacific um, area. Yeah, the title is kind of the the first part of the title, Sayonara, as Susie Wong is referencing two uh, films, I guess, the filmic references. And then the second part of the title, uh, The Opium Den, is referring to the, I guess, the history of opium and the relationship between British Empire and uh, China and Hong Kong. Um, as we'll see here. So in slide six, uh, image six, I guess, uh, Amanda is holding an opium pipe. Um, the so essentially, the there was a um, <laughs> there was a trade deficit between um, Britain and China, um, and as a result, Britain illegally exported opium to essentially get the Chinese populace addicted to it um, to address the trade imbalance. It was illegal, of course, and then you had the opium wars. Uh, in the mid 19th century, and as a result, you had the handover of Hong Kong to uh, Britain. Um, so that's a historical allusion through depicting an opium pipe, and then through the title that is, you know, it's very veiled. Um, but it's something I'm really interested in throughout my works is creating this kind of web of references, and then ideally or hopefully through, you know, reading the painting, studying it, they kind of activate in some way. Well, you call your work citational. Yeah, they're very citational, yeah. So it's a, it is almost like, you know, you everything's a footnote and to be <laughs> yes. explored and then put back together to create a whole. Yeah. I think I spent too long writing academic essays <laughs> in college, and now I'm addicted. So you talk about the, your desire to represent not just the individuals, but your r relationship to them. And you actually mentioned Frank O'Hara's notion of personism. Mm -hmm. Um, but what are some of the ways you do that? Can you talk about that? Yes. So uh, within this painting, I used to do it by literally painting myself with the other person, and then it got kind of tired. Oh, you mean like the family, like the first yeah, person yeah, yeah. feather? Uh -huh. But it got kind of exhausting having to paint myself. Um, so in this painting, I wonder if I can, there's a picture of it. Um, if you see the, the, zo the animal symbols here, um, there's a crane at the bottom, and then there's an ox and a butterfly. Um, the butterfly is Amanda's. She has a tattoo of a butterfly on her. So I, throughout my um, works, I actually reference her with a butterfly a lot. And then Justin is a zodiac, has a zodiac sign of the ox. And they're in a relationship, so that's why I depicted the butterfly on top of the ox. And then below is a crane. Um, throughout my body of work, I um, reference myself. The crane, the only kind of bird is a kind of stand-in for myself, for my own presence. It's a reference to my given Chinese name. Um, so here we can see that, you know, I'm having these animals literally be in, you know, spatial relationship to each other. You can also see here on the left, there again is the crane, the ox, and the um, butterfly. Uh, and the BA is Amanda Ba? Yeah, so in image five, you see the letters BA. That's Amanda's initials, but, you know, flipped again. Ba Amanda. Um, let's see what else. Okay, I'll go over the images of um, in the slide. The first image, if we look at this kind of area, that's a, you know, vertically written English cursive, but it's done in such a way that it looks like Chinese calligraphy. It's illegible, but it's actually English. What does it say? I could not tell you. I, I forget. <laughs> uh, it's very much like spontaneous prose. Sometimes I, actually a lot of times I'll write my own name or um, the city's name. Okay. I mean, I think your signature's um, at the top of the painting. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, the, this image is I, I did a gel medium transfer of um, the poem that I wrote for the show. If you've been to the show, there's a big poem as part of the exhibition. Um, and I transferred some of the lettering onto uh, the painting in this way. You can kind of see the fragments that I did there. The fourth image is an example of, um, you know, what I guess what I call Chinese cardboard iconography, kind of fusing of um, 
you know, the kind of mythic old American West cowboys and whatnot um, with more kind of East Asian iconography or cities, for example. And that's kind of speak to, you know, the hybridity of the Asian American experience and also kind of attesting or pointing out the fact that Asian people have been are part of America, the fabric of America. We're actually fundamental in the making of America. Although, the, you know, we've been allied from that history. Uh, five is the initials and six is the open pipe, which I've gone over. So the next slide I'll go into more. Um, th th this is a painting that I did actually for the James Fuentes show. So you must have seen this, Eugene. Uh, same cities. Um, here's a lot. I'm using a lot more of the kind of um, language fragments. Um, you can see this part of the back was appropriated from a graffiti sticker that I saw in the um, in the streets. Um, you can see here that the vertical cursive lettering is meant to emulate or reference, you know, Chinese calligraphic writing. Uh, these are the process images for when I made Sainara Suzy Wands. Um, as you can see, I start out with a, I essentially draw on the canvas with gouache. Is this from photos or from live? Uh, from Im images, photos, okay. yeah. Composite photos. Um, I always start with the eyes. Um, then I, you know, add all, all these extra things in. It's pretty straightforward, I feel. Face, figure, background. <laughs> so one of the distinctive things about your work is the way you paint a frame around the work and create the fictive space within the frame. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes the, you know, the, the sitters break out of the frame, um, especially in the last one where her foot is on the edge and crosses over. Um, it, you know, it's behind the frame and then it's kind of on top of the frame. Mm -hmm. And um, everything, and, and actually th the painting you're just showing, I, I find the space, I, I wonder if you could just talk about the space a little bit. Because it, the floor, what I think is the floor, is so steeply tilted. And mm -hmm. I, I stand there and I try to make sense of where the f body is and the chair are in space. Mm -hmm. um, How, I mean, can you just talk about how, how about that composition? Yeah, so I'll start talking about the frames. Um, the frames, I mean, as formally, technically, it's a way to um, add a different kind of visual language within the um, piece. So you see it's more, here the, the frame uses more of a black and white kind of, I mean it's meant to emulate kind of ink. Um, and it uses a lot of exposed canvas. So. Aesthetically, it's a way to add some ink. And, but conceptually, it's about kind of creating, it's firstly making it very clear that this is a painting. It's not any kind of objective reality. Um, secondly, it creates almost like a, a barrier, I think. It's a form of opacity and kind of defense, um, almost. Um, the subjects are kind of behind this barrier. It's almost like a plexiglass barrier, the way I see it. But sometimes, you know, they encroach onto the barrier as well. They're kind of confronting you. Maybe they'll step forward and jump you or something. Okay, let's go. Is that it? Oh, sorry. Um, so this piece, um, it's bilingual. It's in French and English. Cause and who's the sitter? The sitter's my friend Chris. She's from Montreal. So that's why I was Montrealist, the realist. Uh, a, lot, a lot of puns <laughs> in my work. Um, and so it essentially tr translates to a, um, a rose ass, which is a kind of rose tinted window. Her favorite flower is a rose between me, you, and the other, AKA the fan of the Orient. Um, you can see the, the circle red things. Those are birds um, that are kind of meant to reference me, kind of you know, circling her and almost orbiting her to index our kind of relationship. Um, and, oh, here's an example of other ways I've encoded relationships or relations uh, within my artworks, so all symbolically. So you see, again, the butterfly, the ox, the crane. Uh, this piece was in the James Francis show. 
Um, but they are both um, Capricorns. Yeah, they're both Capricorns. So I did a two-headed sea goat. And then I'm the crane above. So do you come up with the titles first and then make the painting? Or do you make the... How does that happen? Because the titles are so distinctive. Yeah, um, it's kind of a back and forth. Sometimes I'll have a concept, an idea, and that'll come with a title. Um, as I work in a painting, that'll change. Um, yeah, it's very much a kind of organic process. Um, but back to this piece. This is the piece from the book. I think it's from a, from the Brooklyn Museum. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, it's a fan shape drawing of two birds in the Brooklyn Museum's Asian art collection. I wanted to use a fan because the fan is a very kind of um, femininely encoded symbol. Um, it's also a very quote unquote orientally encoded symbol. Um, so it made sense. I wanted to kind of convey the sense of like like hi high femme, like intense femininity um, in this piece. Uh, you can also see the top kind of symbol is a bagua. Um, it was the first one I took I think, which I, when I saw one uh, in the streets. And can you explain what the what that is, the bagua? It's a um, symbol used in Taoism. Um, it's kind of hard to explain. It's kind of like it's used for like the divination. Um, yeah, I can't really explain it. There's like elements, and there's um, the first I think chapter in the Tao Te Ching. Um, is about that. It's kind of the one the one splits into two, the two splits into four, the four splits into eight. Into eight so it's a cosmological like. diagram? Is yes, it? exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, these are process shots for that painting. Um, pretty straightforward. Anything you notice, Eugenie? Yeah, the numbers. So the numbers yes. on the floor. Uh, a favorite number is three, so okay. <laughs> I included three. Um, so there's me using those symbols are ways to, you know, encode information about the sitter that aren't readily legible or understandable. They kind of require more, I, I guess, research or study um, to, you know, find out what these references mean. So I guess one of the questions I have when I walk through the show and I'm walking people through the show and talking about the paintings, I can never, it, it's like, if you're not with me to explain things, <laughs> I don't necessarily know what things are. And so I'm wondering, um, and this is a question I often have with artists in general, you have a kind of, you use particular symbols to suggest your relationship to the sitter, but, but viewers might not be privy to those codes. And so how, how do you feel about that? Does it matter to you at all? Or is it something, is it more of a, a secret um, relationship that you and the viewer, you and the subject have, or is it something you really want spectators to be aware of? And if so, how are you gonna do that? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I'm really concerned with um, transparency and opacity, especially when it comes to, I my painting is, my paintings are, you know, they are a lot of, how do I put this? I guess I'm concerned with um, paintings, especially figurative paintings of um, you know my communities being all too easily consumed, and um, you know I want people to look at the paintings and not just kind of um, think they know what it is, what the subject's like, based off you know a glance. Um, there's, I want to try and, in a way, protect the subjects through opacity. Um, part of my practice is really inspired by the philosopher Edouard Glissant's conception of opacity, um, where essentially he, um, he talks about letting, he talks about it in the context of cultural exchange and translation, and he says, um, what does he say? He says, he says it's basic basically to it's to let things be opaque, to not let everything be so readily knowable. Um, I'm sure people who's, uh, who speak two languages fluently kind of understand the difficulties in translation and how often there's so much 
lost. Um, and so part of using these op this kind of obscure web of references and symbols is a way to kind of honor the opacity and unknowability of the subject. And so that's why I'm also painting my relationships with these people. Um, because that's all I know of them, is my relationship with them. Um, I wouldn't try and pretend to present a kind of subject, um, a depiction of them which implies that, you know, I, I know what they're like, I know who they are. Um, this is it. This is my full knowledge of them. Um, I think, you know, the very existence of humanness is so murky and opaque. Um, it's best to leave things as a mystery, I think, sometimes. Okay, moving on. Um, let's see. So this title, All American Boyfriend, a.k.a. Gui Lo Lang Zhe. Uh, Gui Lo in Cantonese with means uh, like white guy. Lang Zhe means like handsome or good looking. It's often in Cantonese, um, like an old auntie on the street will call you Lang Zhe or like Lang Lo, <laughs> like pretty boy, pretty girl. That's a very casual word. Um, let's see. So... What interests you about this piece, Eugenie? We talked about this. The hands, I mean, it's such an unusual composition with the mirror and presumably your hands holding the mirror. And, or is it a painting? That, you know, there is that ambiguity of whether it's a painting or a mirror. And it's also much more austere in its composition. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the chi as much Chinese cowboy as some of the other works, mm -hmm. it has a cowboy. Yeah, I wanted to um, kind of depict a almost archetypal cowboy, mm -hmm. like, you know, Caucasian, um, flannel, white cowboy hat, blue jeans, kind of all American uh, vibe. So I wanted to make the painting different um, as a result of that. Um, and through the hands, I wanted to insert my presence in the painting uh, as well, to attest to um, our relationship. Um, and these text fragments that kind of orbit the painting are, is, um, it was prose I wrote about, um, my relationship to this person as well. I've tried to read that on numerous occasions and I, I, I can't make out anything. It's, it's a little frustrating sometimes, but I, but having, I, you, you mean intentionally? I yeah, it's, in, it's intentionally meant to frustrate the... It's kind of forcing you to slowly, it's forcing a slow read rather than a quick read. Um, so this is the object that I cited within the Brooklyn Museum. Um, and I use it to construct this kind of um, oriental looking mirror. So it's a, top, it's a top ornament there. So yeah, I was interested in kind of, you know, positionality and subjecthood and, you know, through the mirror who is interpolated as a subject, who is interpolated as the viewer. By kind of, with my hands, kind of holding up this mirror to the audience, um, you know, how can I think of like America, like holding up to America and saying, oh, this is your archetypal um, American avatar, um, the cowboy. Um. I mean, this is the only Caucasian subject in the exhibition. Yeah, so it was very intentional with, um, I wanted to make it very clear that kind of, um, you know, whiteness and being white is in the absence of race. It's also a race. Um, too often it's seen as kind of the default and mm -hmm. the norm, but, you know, it's also a race comprised of many different ethnicities as well. Uh, these are the process shots. Again, always start with the eye. So this piece is a great introduction to McCoolism's body of McCoolism's body of work, um, which I mentioned earlier on, uh, as well as the references, the visual references they make to LGBT history and visual culture. I um, think we should look at that. That which to me, this is just was one of the most striking paintings um, in I saw in your studio, just because. There were so many references, and it took me a long time to, to yeah. 
decipher them. Yeah, that's uh, you have to really pass through it, I think. Yeah, so you had a, and I know you have it later, you had a photograph by Bob Miser, um, homoerotic photographer. I had to Google, you said it's based on a Bob Miser photo, and I was like, who's Bob Miser? Oh. So I had to Google that. <laughs> and then, um, um, yes, and then the Q, which was, the Q, yeah. I mean, there was just, there were so many references. This, the, the citations were yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So to, to, to start, I'll go over kind of what I'm trying to explore with the coolies in this body of work. It's kind of tracing, you know, how ha has East Asian-ness been depicted and manifested throughout, throughout uh, visual culture, specifically in America. Um, so we can kind of, so when Chinese immigrants first came to America in the late 19th century, they were, you know, um, low paid foreign laborers. Um, there was a lot of racial tension, racial hatred that arrived and then it, you know, entered into legis legislation with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1892, I think. Eight, yeah. Um, so the first image is a political cartoon. Um, it expressed the fear of Chinese immigrants, 1881. Um, essentially, a Chinese man stands on a pedestal surrounded by a harbor. There's a cartoon imitation of Statue of Liberty. His clothes are tattered, his hair is in a long trim tail, his eyes are squint. The words diseases, filth, immorality, and ruin to white labor um, float around his head as a kind of, you can't see in this image, but they're part of the halo. Um, number two is a political cartoon called The Coming Man from the San Francisco magazine, The Wasp, uh, 1881. Uh, number three is an image of Uncle Sam kicking out the Chinaman, referencing the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and I'm bringing these up just to kind of, I guess, um, show you the kind of ways in which you know East Asianness um, was depicted. Th these are obviously very harsh depictions. There were a few people who were not anti-Chinese, um, but you can see these kind of tropes, right? The visual trope of the kind of squinty, ratty-looking. A uh, man with the braid and a pigtail. Um, the the queue, which is the hairstyle that they um, are wearing, that's the braid. Um, they were worn by Chinese immigrants at the time. Um, it was actually f imposed um, by a foreign, by the, the Ming Dynasty or the Qing Ma Dynasty? Manchu Dynasty. Yeah, the Manchu the Dynasty. The Manchu Qing Dynasty. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so they had to actually have their hair in this hairstyle if they wanted to return back to China, which they all intended, most of them intend, intended to do. They didn't know they were going to die under mountains yeah. on the railroad. Yeah. Um, but as a result, you know, because it's a long braid, it was seen as being feminine and seen as being kind of deviant, and so it was a target of attacks. And so that's mm -hmm. where... No, I mean, workers were, were killed and lynched because of their yeah. hair. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when I first saw this painting, you said, this is my beefcake painting. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> but you've also mentioned, I mean, you mentioned to me early on that Marsden Hartley was one of a painter you yeah, admired. Yeah, yeah. And I immediately thought of both Mars of Marsden Hartley, both because of his beefcake paintings and also because of his German officer paintings that use the circles and the mm -hmm, numbers the and symbols, your yeah. love of, you know, symbols. So he's kind of um, does double duty for you. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great artist. Um, but so this slide kind of shows, you know, the changing ways in which East Asians have been in American visual culture. I'm showing uh, Seshu Hayakawa, which I don't think many people know of, but he was actually a Hollywood heartthrob in the silent era. Um, he was seen as being kind of having this like devilish, um, kind of sexy yet foreign mm. uh, vibe to him. Um, and then you have kind of Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan, obviously, the. Um, of kind of martial arts becoming a huge cultural export of East Asia. Um, you have Dragon Ball Z, uh, which was um, you know a huge hit and was um, I guess the main kind of cultural export of J Japan at the time. It was at least to America. It was American audiences and Western audiences' first exposure to um, anime. Um, and then we have BTS at the White House in 2022. Um, so it's interesting just thinking about the change, the change of, um, this is all um, influenced by class and labor. There's different types of labor that these East Asian people are doing. 
uh, in the 19th century, they were, you know, doing very, very underpaid labor, um, working in mines, laying um, tracks. And then now you have, you know, with South Korea and Japan especially, cultural, the culture, I the culture industries are huge. Um, there's so much cultural export going on, um, you know, with the rise of K-pop, for example. So Coolism is kind of just, is kind of interested in these kind of um, shifts. And it does this through the performance of dressing up as these kind of figures. So they're not self-portraits, even though they're all you. Yeah, they, I'm kind of the- or Many of them are you. Yeah, they're meant to, the, I mean, I pose for them and have to um, use myself as a reference, but they're not intended to be me. Um, that itself is kind of speaking to the kind of slippage almost fungibility uh, between the, the perceived fungibility of East Asian people, the trope that, you know, we all look the same. Um, let's go on. So this is the reference to the Book Museum collection. Um, it's a contemporary piece, uh, Two Ball Dragons. And you can see it's above the figure's head here. Looks like a whip. Like yeah. Whip calligraphy. Yeah, it's kind of a long, really long hair. What about the title? It has a very... Um oh, yeah. Leather Daddy's High Binder Odalisk. Um, I mean, it's a leather daddy, so it's pretty obvious. High Binder was a term used to describe um, in Chinatowns in the, I guess, late 19th century and then early 20th century, um, kind of Chinese assassins, uh, the Tongs, which were kind of group of mafia-like groups in Chinatown, San Francisco especially. The word high binder was used because of the way the hair was held. Um, yes, yeah, so I wanted to include that kind of sense of danger and risk with this very, you know, this beefcake um, painting. And odalisk is a reference to the, you know, our historical trope of the odalisk. The nude reclining woman. Yeah, they wanted to have a standing uh, nude muscular man instead. Although he's not, he's wearing pants, it's fine. So yeah, the so oops, so that's the reference to Bob Meiser. These are the um, process images of the painting. I was actually kind of struggling a lot with the initially it was intended to be red curtains, um, but it didn't really look right. And then I went over with the kind of periwinkle purple. You can kind of see the red underneath the the um, purple. So this is hanging right across from it. I, I, I think of that as... Yes, the second beefcake. Um, this is, let me see. So I'll go with the title first. Gold Mountain is a reference to Chinese immigrants initially first came to America and they called it Gold Mountain because of the gold rush. They were seeking gold, they were seeking wealth. Um, cruiser is a reference to um, gay cruising, essentially. Um, and the mine shaft is a reference. God, there's so many references in the title. We'll, we'll get to it in the next few slides, actually. Um, but essentially, so, let me see. So I wanted to kind of um, fuse this um, kind of image of the Chinese gold miner or the Chinese railroad layer where the kind of more um, contemporary, you know, 20th century homoerotic kind of imagery. It's also making it very contemporary. He's wearing Tim's, as you can see here. <laughs> I actually ordered the Tim's twice, and I returned them after I did, after I used them as a reference. Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So the Transcontinental Railroad was a 1,911 mile railroad, railroad constructed between 1863 and 1869 that ran from Iowa to Oakland, essentially connecting the eastern, the pre-existing railway system of the eastern U.S. to the west, um, revolutionizing and ultimately enabling uh, westward expansion. So America, as we see it, as we know it today, um, so 80 percent of these railroad workers were Chinese. Over 12,000 Chinese laborers um, were working. Um, they worked in incredibly hazardous conditions. They were underpaid. There were lots of deaths, explosions. Um, and yet they were largely left out of popular memory. 
Uh, the image on the right is a well-known photo of the kind of final ceremony, the driving of the last sp spike, i.e. the completion of the railroad. And there are only maybe two identified Chinese workers in this image, um, even though it was mainly Chinese laborers building this railroad. Um, so I was kind of thinking about the archive, absences in the archive, um, and then constructing a kind of, you know, depiction of like a fictitious um, Chinese um, railroad worker. Um, what, what, what kind of work does that do? So Rex is a living American artist and illustrator um, closely associated with the homosexual fetish shot of the 70s and 80s New York, New York and San Francisco. Um, he did artwork for this club called the Mineshaft. Um, it was a gay sex slash BDSM club in the meatpacking district mm -hmm. um, between 1976 and 1985. Um, it was a pretty iconic club. Foucault went there um, a lot, apparently. Um, this image is Freddie Mercury wearing a mine shaft t-shirt. So it was a very, very kind of iconic club within queer culture. You have all these queer celebrities who would then go there. It was a very exclusionary club as well. It was very much you had to present a particular way. It was a larger, you know, white male clientele. Um, right. Simon Wu wrote a really interesting piece, um, or made some very interesting observations about he and you um, reimagining yourselves yeah. at the mine shaft. Um, and we, we would never have gone in. Well, you weren't born in, in, in 1982, yeah. neither of you, and but yeah. reimagining what yeah. it would have been like and, and kind of queer, kind of colorizing it. Yeah, that was a really great text I wrote. Um, yeah, so the, the this painting is kind of, uh, obviously he's a very contemporary man, but he's almost, could also be historical in a way. I'm kind of intending to be anachronistic and kind of fuse these different you know eras and centuries together in one painting. Um, and this is the Brooklyn Museum um, object collection reference. Right, which I learned because I don't read Chinese, I don't know what it says, but I did go through the show with two Chinese-speaking um, curators who told me that this painting is flipped. Yes, I horizontally flipped all the calligraphy, and I moved all around. So if you read Chinese, I don't know if what, I don't know what I would say. It would be kind of jumbled up, I think. Um, and this is, these are progress images. Are we good on time? Or? So I came to your studio one day, and you had made the um, pickaxe out of cardboard. Yeah, I literally made the, like a pickaxe out of car I use a cardboard tube, and I, I was very proud Paper of myself. I used a lot of tape to. <laughs> it felt like I was in an architecture class or something. Um, and then did you photograph yourself holding it? Yeah, but it didn't really help because <laughs> the cardboard is like a, a tan color, and I had the pickaxe be kind of a more dark color. But I guess I was procrastinating or something. Uh, this is another piece from the Coolism series. This is in the show, Cowboy Kato Cooley, a.k.a. Bruce's Bitch. Um, this is referencing Thomas Finland, who's probably the most influential creator of kind of gay erotic images. And he heavily influenced 20th century gay culture. Um, I also reference um, Bruce Lee and his role as Kato in um, the show The Green Hornet, um, 1966 and 1967. Um, and he's wearing kind of a leather mask. So I drew the association between his kind of superhero costume and kind of more like uh, queer fetish leather costumes. Oh, and you can see at the top, it says AKA, um, also known as. Right, and the bottom you says. It says Cowboy Kato Cooley, but backwards. Yeah. This is one of the earlier pieces from Yes. <laughs> This one is I I did for the James Quintus yeah. show, and it's smaller. Yeah. Than this one is another part of the Coolism series. Slice on Goku turns twenty-three. It's pretty straightforward, I think. I'm just dressed as Goku. I think. I think a lot of people have said I look like Goku in the past. And my head, I know my hair has get gone too long when people start pointing at it and saying you look Goku, and I need to get a haircut. Um, 
this piece, All Glory at Hall, aka Ends of Empire, this is a huge piece. It's seven feet tall. The image makes it look really small, <laughs> but it's actually very, very big. It looms. It definitely looms, yeah. Uh, this piece is an example of my poem picture body of work, although this is more of a hybrid example. And this is the only poem picture within the show, actually. But poem pictures are essentially um, works that take language as their kind of main subject. Um, these are all works on paper. I, I did it for a James Fuentes show a few years back. As you can see, there's um, this text is actually, I guess some letters are flipped, but it's written normally in you know English Roman letters. But I kind of bury the text by going over it to create you know illegibility to make it more difficult to mm. read. Um, but yeah, I wanted to with this piece make the flag uh, loom. It's seven feet tall. I had the subject be at the bottom right, the the stars be at the top left to try and make it seem kind of um, unattainable. Uh, yeah, this is more examples of the language. Um, but so the buried text in this instance is actually, I collaborated with the subject, uh, it's a good friend of mine. It's actually appropriated from the welcome letter that you get when you, become a, when you become a naturalized American citizen. And the subject was recently naturalized, Filipino American. It's, I mean, it makes sense, but it's very crazy language. It's like very hyper patriotic. It's like welcome to our fraternity. Um, this land is now your land. Um, yeah, I was really interested by it. And so we wor we kind of appropriated that and remixed it, but we changed every instance of the word America to be the word empire. Um, as you can see, the word empire throughout the piece is the only word that's um, not horizontally inverted, the rest are. Um, I guess trying to allude to the history of US imperialism within um, the Philippines um, after yeah. the Spanish-American War. I mean, this hangs fairly close to the Sayonara piece, so I think, which I think is a really nice conversation across the room. Yeah, it's it just as about American, the Ameri American imperialism in in the Asia Pacific area. Yeah, it's a, a, a kind of um, main point of research, I think, for my body of work. Uh, I think that's that's it actually. Um, I guess we'll do Q&A now. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much for that rich conversation. Hi. I was wondering, um, well, research is such a big part of your process. And um, if going through like the Brooklyn Museum's permanent collection if there was anything that like surprised you or just was like, and how that process, if you can go into a little more with um, back and forth with the paintings of going through and and preparing to make a work. Um, I, I think I was actually, when I was writing the proposal, I was honestly pretty scared. It was like a big undertaking. I don't know if I've told you this, but I was pretty frightened. I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. Then I walked through the Brooklyn Museum um, and I saw the, the plaques in the Sayonara um, painting. I saw the plaques. And I was like, oh, how can I... This is a really beautiful object. Um, it's meant to be from, you know, my quote-unquote motherland. Um, but it's not. I'm interpreting it and perceiving it from a Western... And in a Western institution, having a Western upbringing, this object is, you know, foreign to me, even though it's not meant to be. So that kind of feeling of estrangement was, I think, something that sparked. Um, I mean, I was only already incorporating objects in previous pieces using the archive in that way. Um, but at least that kind of walking through the collection actually kind of sparked, oh, how can I make this site specific? How do I make this more relevant to the Brooklyn Museum? Um, yeah. I saw we have a question online. Um, Oscar, uh, one of our online participants is asking, how much of your process is spontaneous and unfolding with the painting versus planned out ahead of time? Um, it's I guess I often will have a composition planned, 
Um, so it creates a kind of skeleton that you then work with. A lot of the kind of ornaments and the symbols are often spontaneous, but oftentimes they're also planned. I guess that's not really answering the question. It's, it, it's a mix of both, I think. Hi. So, ooh, hi. Um, so I saw there's a lot of stars, sort of like a sheriff, and then there's like the hand drawn, then there's the, of course, like American stars, your star. <laughs> what are the stars, you know? Um, stars are a really interesting symbol, the five pointed star. Um, you know, it's used in a lot of nationalistic flags, the American flag for one. Uh, yeah. Um, it's also used in the Chinese flag. It's also used in as a symbol of socialism, the red star. Um, you kind of see. Now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, here there's a red star in the guy's hat. There's like a red star somewhere else, I think, as well. Um, and there's obviously the sheriff star as well. It's a symbol of, you know, the old west and also a symbol of policing. Aren't the stars in the um, flag painting co uh, Argento? Yeah. So the. Oops, sorry, I'm zooming through this. So I don't. I guess I don't really include any. Oh wait, that's quite accurate. I don't know. Okay, I have no idea how to use Windows to do slides. Well, you can just say what I yeah. think you can kind of. Um, say. but <laughs> sorry, but the there's like little stars within the red stripes. That's better, thank you. Um, it means a sequence to the um, LGBTQ pride flag. It's kind of an allusion also to um, the concept of homo-nationalism um, theorized by Jasmine K. Poir, which is essentially the, um, essentially the kind of incorporation of LGBTQ rights within nationalism and ultimately kind of imperialism. Um, the kind of defanging of, you know, the original radicalness of queer politics. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. You have really amazing vivid colors in your artwork, and I wanted to know why the choice of colors that you often do. Um, well, I guess in this painting, there's obviously blue and red for the flag, but I... I guess I just like blue, really bl bright blue. It's a really beautiful color that's rarely found in the wild. And I like red because I think red's like a very Chinese color. It's a very, I've just always been drawn to red. I think I, I like good and red, I like good and blue. <laughs> I think that's it, yeah. Oscar, I had a question. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about, just building off of Anita's question about um, your research and how you relate it to your subjects mm -hmm. are, is the subject first and then you're searching for, um, you know, a certain iconography. Uh, you're obviously a collector of, of, um, visual material, Border, right? Yeah. So, and also just historical narratives. And so I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more about your research process. Um, yeah, so some, so this painting of Chris, oh my god, I'm going so fast. This painting of Chris, for example, I didn't begin with like a kind of idea. Chris is just very like model-esque. She, she knows what she looks like. She knows what kind of looks good aesthetically. Um, the other one, so for example, with this, the Sayonara uh, painting, um, that began with seeing the image of Marlon Brando, and I saw it on Pinterest. Um, it began with that, and then I kind of, you know, I like doing, I, I kind of always do a painting of Amanda and Justin, so I wanted to, it made sense to associate these two images together and kind of um, fit them into that. So sometimes a, a reference image or even a concept actually will spur the production of the artwork. Other times it'll be just kind of, I guess, more, more spontaneous. Um, you mentioned a number of times, because you showed a bunch of your uh, process work in the slides, that you begin with the eyes. Um, do you 
do you reflect on that often? Is it, do you feel like it's about having the work regard you as you create it? Or is it about a likeness? Or I'd, I'd love to hear uh, more about that. Um, I think once you kind of flesh out the eyes, it's, it becomes very human-like and like a person. Um, I guess I, that's really, I, I need to properly examine that, but I think it is just kind of once you have the eyes done, they, they ultimately end up being the most significant um, indicator, index of like a human being or like a person as a face. Um, you know, the, the way we kind of identify each other, you know, people wearing masks, you can identify someone else through the eye. Um, so it's always just, I think, the most compelling part about a face, for me, if that makes sense. Like, I, it feels, if, if I don't get the eye right, um, and the paint is still wet, and I can't work on it, I, like, cover it up <laughs> to hide it, because, like, yeah, I, I can't focus otherwise. Hi. Um, so, you're obviously, like, a, a perfect, uh, you know, you you work with a lot of like found imagery and um, what I found most interesting is, uh, you know, the thorough um, research you've done into uh, a lot of history. And I think what I'm most interested by is like, what do you think the, like the importance to you as like a person in like working with those like historical contexts and then sometimes like uh, recontextualizing them into a modern context like what is the importance of that to you um great question with this body of work because it was in a museum i wanted it to be kind of more historical and kind of bring to light certain histories i may not have pe pe people might not have known about so part of it is about that and um you know exposing these histories through you know an artwork um, other times, for example, a lot of the references to kind of queer visual culture, I, I genuinely don't think, you know, a lot of people would kind of get those references unless you, know, you know, are part of that community, you're kind of attuned to that visual culture or history. So for me, that's more of a kind of organic, natural thing where I'm really looking at these images and then if you get it, you get it. Um, yeah, but I, I, I think it's um, important for, at least for me, for my paintings to, you know, have something to say. I think also from a, um, the point of view of the institution, um, I mean, Oscar's just spoken a bit about his work, but we haven't really spoken about the framing of the exhibition in an institutional context. And that's, you know, another topic or conversation. But um, if you want to identify kind of the whole history of violence against East Asians in America, you know, didn't just spring to nowhere. This really situates that. Um, and what I find amazing about Oscar's paintings is that they are, they are so educational without being overtly educational. <laughs> I mean yeah, like I have a, a beefcake telling you about <laughs> well, about labor and labor. about <laughs> Chinese labor. I mean, it, it's such an, un, uh, you know, a, a mix of it's kind of the seductiveness of the painting and imagery uh, is also, you know, allows uh, or makes people curious about what it is. And, and I think looking into, you know, what, what these things are. I mean, that, that was me down the Google rabbit yeah. hole. So like I, th I think there's, that's, you know, I'm a visual producer. Like, why am I doing this? Um, I think part of why I insist on being an artist is kind of the power of aesthetics. Um, and beauty to convey something um, more than, you know, there's multiple values that any object or specifically a painting can have. You know, there's an aesthetic value, there's a conceptual value, historical value, and then you have the monetary value, of course. Um, and the monetary value can get way insane, a lot, in very, very inflated when you have, you know, the, fr the financialization of the art market, art as an asset, for example. Um, and so I think when it's just kind of an aesthetic volume and a monetary value, there's, I don't know, I'm just like producing like pretty pictures for a rich person to hang up in their living room. So part of why, part of my kind of response, there's also 
at least trying to make sure there's some kind of conceptual and social and historical value to it as well. It makes me think a little bit of French 19th century history painting by Jacques-Louis David and the sort of um, opportunity to educate through history and to um, urge, uh, inspire people to their uh, kind of take the higher moral ground and you know, it's kind of... Yeah, <laughs> and like part of the, I, I, s I you know, don't want to be too didactic and I think part of it is by, you know, these because the painters are relatively, there's a lot of layered illusions and opacity, part of it is like inviting the viewer to kind of read more into it. I want to create more of a relationship between the viewer and the painting. It's not just like I'm giving you something and you have to eat it. Um, it's like there's a kind of, it creates, ideally that's what I want, a relationship between the artwork and the spectator and also me, the artist. Um, yeah, I'm just obsessed with relation. As a very conceptual figurative artist, do you find that your choice of sitter, like your friends, does that influence the conceptual aspect of the piece? Or do you more so first come to terms with a concept and a message you want to convey, and then specific people that you love fall into mind that would fit perfectly into the composition? It depends. Yeah. Um, for example, with the flag painting, because my friends Filipino American, I was. They kind of all kind of came together, kind of you know examining U.S. imperialism in the Pacific and in the Philippines. Um, it just kind of made sense. Um, other times, I'll begin with uh, you know an idea, and then something kind of fits into it, slots into it. Or other times, it's the other way around. It, it's, it's a mix of both, I think. Um, there uh, seem to be kind of two aspects of your work um, which complement each other really well. Um, like the kind of hyper-referentiality, which kind of has to be decoded or can be decoded, and then also the desire to kind of protect your friends, right? And who are non-white, particularly in a moment of like really intense, whatever, exploitation of non-white cultures. And um, cultures, excuse me. And I think that's really actually kind of fascinating as a, as a position, like those two things working together. It's, in, it's incredibly distinct to see a kind of like visual logic that is like so robust, like it just, what you're, that kind of makes sense if that's what you want to do. Um, and I'm curious about who art historically or um, in the present day you're kind of looking toward or inspired or being inspired by when thinking about the relationship between those two specific things? Um, that's a really good question. Um, so the two things are essentially kind of a desire to, in a way, like, to pr protect the sitters, but also the, I guess, to use our work as a way to invite viewers in and to tell them something, essentially. Um, that's a great question. I'm trying to think which other artists. Um, I mean, artists that I like, that I reference a lot, that I don't necessarily think in terms of that, but just formally and aesthetically, is like Martin Wong, like Craig James Marshall, Alice Neal. Um, for example... Lucian Freud. Yeah, Lucian Freud is a big one. And I grew, I grew up in Britain, so in high school I was like, copying uh, his works and stuff. Did I do a reference? To th there's one painting that, this painting was, I don't know if anyone saw the Alice Neal show on the net a while ago, but there's a painting of these two guys in the fruit bowl, and one guy has like hairy chest, he's wearing a flannel, and the other guy is more subdued. This is a direct reference to that composition. Um, so I guess formally and technically, and I guess conceptually there are a lot of um, artists that I reference. I guess maybe Martin Wong kind of fits the, the bill for both because, um, you know, he used a lot of kind of Chinese cowboy uh, iconography. Um, that's a great question. I'm not sure if I answered it to your, <laughs> to your liking. Uh, one more question online that I think is a beautiful way to, to conclude, which is, um, 
um, if you could both, I think, both speak to why Asian American portraiture is captivating the imagination right now. Why are we finding this um, so compelling, or, or are, you, are you seeing it becoming more and more um, compelling in America? I have a cynical take. I'm not going to say. <laughs> Um, I think, so kind of right now, the art market, there's a huge kind of boom and demand for figurative works, like minority figurative works, um, women figurative artists, queer figurative artists, artists of color, for example. Um, and I think, you know, I think a lot of it is, uh, how do I put this? Um, it's frustrating to feel that people only pay attention to you when your community n your, your communities um, have been you know experienced trauma or have been attacked or something and then oh people pay attention to us because they remember we're oppressed um, so I, I, have a I have a very cynical view of it um, obviously it's very good that um, artists like me are getting increased visibility and um, rising in the art world, it's a privilege for, for me to be able to say that. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's like, why do we have to wait this long? Um, part of me is concerned about the art market and wealthy collectors kind of um, buying an artwork just based on the identity of the artist or just based on the identity of the sitters, for example, not really understanding the artwork or even bothering to understand the artwork. So that's why I'm in my works, having these kind of opaque references. It's what I was talking about with Edward Lissant's idea of opacity and cons consumability. Yeah, consumability. Yeah, like I don't want to be too easily consumed. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm hard to chew. Um, yeah, yeah, like I, I don't want like an artwork I make just to be consumed and, trans and then um, converted into like an asset of money. Um, I do think it, it has to do with the increased vis visibility of, of East Asians for whatever reason, through mm -hmm. you know various reasons, yeah. and um, yeah, a heightened visibility, and some yeah. of it having to do with trauma and violence, and so a, a large part of it is also just like the work that people like you are doing and curators and people in the art world as well. Um, that's all very important as well. What I'm going to say is this particular point in time reminds me a lot of the multicultural 90s. And um, I was part of the group Godzilla in the early 90s, in Godzilla Asian American Art Network, which was intended to raise the visibility of um, Asian American artists and arts professionals. So I think what's changed between the 90s and now is the interest in um, examining structures and in enacting structural change as opposed to perhaps fitting into the existing art world. So just the fact that you are talking about commodification and your awareness of, of who might buy your work and for what reasons I think is quite different than an artist in the 90s might um, have been thinking about. So, and then, um, yeah, I think all of the interest in DEIA in um, broadening access is part of also part of the interest in, in mm -hmm. Asian American artists and you know yeah. so-called underrepresented artists underrepresented only if you are not from that community yeah. <laughs> like oh multiculturalism went away it's like well for who <laughs> <They've> always <been. laughs> it's always yeah. been here but I guess I'm also thinking of um, Martin Wong and the increased market, um, or I guess the greater recognition in the art world, um, and how sad it, I, I mean, obviously that, that's amazing, right? He's an amazing artist who I look up to a lot. But it's also sad that he didn't get that recognition at his time. Um, and you know, obviously there's um, historical redress that um, everyone's doing, which is good. But yeah, I guess I'm. I, I guess I'm a little weary and um, a little cynical, but I guess also hopeful and, and thankful. Well, one can only be hopeful. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for this really incredible conversation.
everyone please join us um, in the student gallery right across the hall here for a light reception.